How many of you know there is something about the name Hallelujah. Jesus? Yes. 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 That is, when you say somebody has a favorite song, that's my song right there. <laughs> yes, sir. There's something about the yes, name so of right. Jesus when yes, I'm going so through. When I'm downtrodden and things aren't going exactly my way, there's something that happens when I call on the name of Jesus that even if the situation doesn't work in my favor, my soul is at ease because Jesus comes and he comforts me in that time when me and Therese uh, were getting ready to get married and after the wedding at the reception, there is some young men from Oklahoma City who I used to follow all the time. They were praise dancers. If they was praise dancing in the middle of the park, I was at the praise dance supporting this, these young men. And she had them young men to come. And, and, and she said, I need you to sit down. I, I got a special gift for you. And the song came on and them young men praise dance to something in the name of Jesus. So I'm celebrating that I just married the most beautiful woman, God gift to me, woman in the world, and tears are flowing down my face because the Lord had answered my prayer. See, I prayed for a wife. I didn't just go find one. I say, Lord, send me. And there was something in the name of Jesus. And when and when it was all over, uh, uh, Pastor Scott, then I began to praise him. I began to praise his holy name yeah. because the prayer that I had asked for yeah. in Jesus' name had been answered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I don't know about y'all, but I am so blessed. And what they say, highly favored to be able to be in the house of the Lord uh, once again. Yeah. And it is time for our call to worship. Call to worship will be coming from Psalms, Psalms 8. Call to worship, Psalms 8. And our call to worship reads as thus. Lord, O oh Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of thy mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies, and thou might as still the enemies and thy avengers. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moons and the stars, but thou have ordained. What is man that thou mightest, uh, that thou, thou, that thou is mindful of him? Uh -huh. The sons of man, thou visited him. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and have crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to be have dominion over the works of thy hand and has put all things under his feet, all sheep, oxen, yield and yield and beasts of the field, the fowls of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the sea. O Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come this morning to thank you for being so excellent to us, Father God, that you would create all things, Father God, and then see that it is not uh, what you wanted it to be, Father God. So you took dust, and out of dust, Father God, you created man. And even when you seen man running around by himself and being over the animals that you had created, you said it wasn't enough, Father God, and you created a helpmate for him. You created woman. How excellent is your name, Father God, in all the earth because you formed it, Father God. You fashioned it, Father God. You set the sun and the moons and the stars in, in, in the heavens, Father God. So this morning, Father, we say thank you for all that you've done, Father God, for creating us in your image. We thank you, Father God. We Thank you that we are allowed to come into your house of worship once again, Father God. But we have to be so mindful to thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, Father God, who came down 42 generations, Father God, to die on an old rugged cross for the sins of the world, Father God, because you knew that man would do his own thing.
thing, Father God, and the only way that you could make it right was through shed blood, Father God. But you got tired of the sacrifice of animals, Father God. And you said that you would send a one and one time only sacrifice without spot and without blemish. And that was your only begotten son. So this morning, Father God, we say thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this church that sits on this corner, Father God. We thank you that we are still allowed to come here and worship in your name, Father God. We're still allowed to raise you up on high from this corner, Father God. We just want to say thank you, Father God, for the ups and downs that we had to go through through this week, Father God. We say thank you, Lord, and we walk in here this morning with our tanks on E, Father God. We pray that you would fill us with your word this morning, that we may go back out into the world and be all the light that you have us to shine. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. If we haven't said it all week, we want to say it this morning. We just want to thank you for your excellence. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what, you're, what you've done, Father God. We thank you for pulling us up out of the muck and the myrrh this morning, Father God. And we ask this morning, Father God, to be with all those who are in attendance, Father God. We pray this morning for all of those young people, Father God, who are graduating from grade school and middle school and high school and college, Father God. We ask that you put a hedge of protection around them, Father God. Watch over them, guide them, and strengthen them. We pray for our music ministry this morning, our ushers, Father God, our welcoming committee, Father God. But then we pray for our pastor. We ask that you be with him as he breaks the bread of life with us this morning, Father God. Give him words from on high, Father God, that we would be strengthened by hearing your word this morning, Father God. We will be revived, Father God. Whatever is ailing us, whatever is going on in our lives, Father God, we want to hear a word to know that it's going to be all right, Father God, because we stand firm in your word, knowing that if we cast all our cares on you, that you will sift through them like wheat, Father God. I pray this morning for a word. I pray that you would be with us. I pray that you would guide this service, Father God. I pray in the end that you would accept our worship unto you. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church family. Good morning, church family. Good morning. We are here for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to lift up the name of Jesus Amen. and worship Amen. him in spirit and in truth. Amen. Amen. And as you're sitting there this morning, I'd like for you to consider the words of Psalm 139, verses 23 to 24, and let this be your prayer today. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And so this first song that we'd like to render today is Search Me. Praying, Lord, 
Lord, and we need your protection today. So guide us with your word, the word today. We need your direction today. We are children, Lord, and we have to for your protection. And we ask you to guide us with your word, because we need continued direction. And we know that you, the Lord, whether I'm right, you, the Lord, whether I'm wrong, you, the Lord, whether I'm right or wrong. Jesus. 
And the Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, in verse 7, cast all of your cares upon him because he cares for you. Amen. It's time to talk to God. And I say it's time to talk to God because sometimes we can make prayer so difficult. But prayer is simply talking to God. Whatever is heavy on your heart, whatever is burdening your soul, take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. So I invite you to join me as I talk to God on our behalf. As I talk to God, all you've got to do is have faith. Have faith in God. God in heaven, we thank you for the privilege wonder and the mystery of talking to you. God, we thank you that you are an omnipresent everywhere God. You are a God that possesses all power and a God who has all knowledge. And God, we come in faith knowing that as your children, if we ask, seek, and knock, that the door shall be opened unto us. Oh God, we've been young and old, but we've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. We know, God, that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. We declare like the psalmist, in my distress I called upon the Lord, and my cry came unto him even unto his ear. And so, God, we come collectively with one heart and with one voice, lifting our burdens, lifting our cares, lifting our concerns unto the God, the God of heaven and the God of earth. Father, you are our refuge and our strength, very present help in time of trouble. And God, so many of us are experiencing doubt, uh, despair, uh, despondency, uh, difficulty. Oh God, so many are on the brink of simply giving up. But God, we come this morning holding and clinging to your unchanging hand. Father, we thank you that you are God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are God who never leaves us nor forsakes us. You are a God that has proven yourself faithful in the past, and God, we trust your faithfulness even in the present. We thank you that you are a God that provides for our future. Father, we come right now in this worship experience. Father, we come thanking you for your son, Jesus Christ, that uh, lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. We thank you for not only his blood, but we thank you for his precious name that gives us access into the presence of God. Father, we come knowing that our needs can be met in your presence. We come knowing that peace and joy can be obtained in your presence. God, we know that you're able to meet financial need. You're able to meet physical need, emotional need, mental need, and most of all, spiritual need. God, you've got it all covered. So much so that Paul said that you will supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory, by Christ Jesus. Father, we pray that you bless us. Pray, God, that you continue to keep us. Father, we pray, God, that you continue to strengthen us and encourage us as only you can. And God, we just want to pause now and give your name glory, give your name honor, and give your name the praise. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And the saints of God said amen and praise the Lord. Good morning, church family. Uh, the latter part of the, 19th, the 20th century, 19th century, about throughout the mid-20th century, there was an American uh, inventor by the name of R.G. Letourneau. Uh, he's responsible for about 300 inventions and a numerous number of, of patents uh, that he made, and he was very successful. Uh, and he, he, he set out to deem himself uh, the businessman of God, 
That's what he called himself. And so just like many of us, his giving started out small. But as he became uh, more wealthy because of his inventions, he increased his giving based on his wealth. And he got to the point where uh, Reverend Williams, he was given 90 percent of his income to the Lord's work. Uh, and, and, and this is how we this is how we he looked at. It. He says, I keep shoveling out money and God keeps shoving it back to me. The only difference is God has a bigger shovel. And so I'm not here to ask you to give 90 percent of your income. I know we're dealing with inflation and all these other things going on, gas prices, food prices, everything is going up. I'm not here to ask you to give 90 percent. But the, the moral of the story is to be consistent in your giving to the kingdom. So, you know, no matter how much you give, the Bible tells us, you know, you give what's on your heart and God will give you the increase uh, of whatever it is that you give. So whether you give 90 percent, 80 percent, 10 percent, 2 percent, you give whatever it is on your heart. And I promise you, God will give it back to you. God rewards us uh, when we take care of his business. The Bible tells us in Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, all of your needs uh, will be added unto you. They will be met. And so one way uh, that we could give here at First Baptist, we can text to give. Uh, you can text to the, eight, uh, the 844 number. You can give online. You go to our, uh, our website, fbcnt.org, or you can mail it here. Or those of you who are here, uh, you can drop it off on your way in or on your way out. But again, no matter what you give, give diligently, give cheerfully, and see that God will certainly bless you uh, because of your contributions to the kingdom. Uh, if you will bow with me in a word of prayer, God, we thank you. We love you and we praise you. And because we love you and we want to show our gratitude in, in numerous ways, one of the ways we show that is through our giving, God. So we thank you for the blessings that you give to us and through obedience and adoration and love of you and of this kingdom uh, that we partake of. We give back a portion of what you have given to us, God, and we pray that our offering, that our tithes that we give well, will be a blessing unto you and it'll be a blessing unto your people and that you will get the glory for what it is used for, Lord. So we thank you, we love you, and we praise you, give you all the honor and glory that's in your son. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Set me on fire 
from the inside, from the inside of me. All I want is for you, for you to be glorified, you to be lifted.
our Savior is. He lets us know that he came, he died, he rose that we might be redeemed. And God, as we now are still in your presence, we know, God, that your word will speak to each and every individual need. Father, we know that the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall remain forever. Speak now. Speak truth. Speak grace. Speak mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I know that you have your Bibles, and I'm going to ask you to join me in Paul's second letter to the church, Corinth. Paul's second letter to the church, Corinth, fourth chapter. From the Christian Standard Bible, I want to read verses 8, 9, in 10. Paul says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. We are always carrying the death of Jesus in our body so that the life of Jesus may also be displayed in our body. As you are seated, I want this morning to talk about being knocked down, but not knocked out. Knocked down, but not knocked out. When I was a little boy, I was a boxing fan. I grew up watching Wild World of Sports. When boxing was not pay for view, it was just free every Saturday. Uh, and the reason why I was a boxing fan as a little boy is because my daddy was a boxing fan. Uh, he boxed in the military, and I was so much a boxing fan that when I was seven or eight years old, uh, I was going to join the Golden Gloves. So I got my little boxing equipment, and I was working out in the front yard. And I really can't tell by the mask, but I think that's Sydney right there, my best friend from day one. And Sydney was out there with me. We were going to be Golden Gloves boxers. But then my daddy took me downtown to a Golden Glove boxing match. And little boys my age, eight years old, I said, Daddy, they really hitting each other. And next thing I know, I had a basketball. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, I was a fan of boxing. And one of the things about boxing, particularly boxing movies like Rocky, what is always so interesting, engaging, and captivating uh, is when Rocky would get knocked down he would always find a way and muster the strength to get back up. And many of us in life, we find ourselves knocked down. And we often are trying uh, to muster up the strength to get up. But the thing is, life is not a movie. And the difference between Life in a movie is that we cannot always get ourselves up. But the text here is tailored to teach you and I that when we get knocked down, we don't have to pick ourselves up. As a matter of fact, as much as I love Donnie McClurkin's music, he says, we fall down and we get up. That sounds good, but in reality... It doesn't always work. Uh, we, we need some strength and some resources beyond ourselves that when life knocks us down, we've got somebody who can lift us up. And the Apostle Paul, uh, in our text on this morning, 
uh, is wanting us to understand something uh, about what we do in our weakness. And my brothers and sisters, Paul says in our weakness, we can trust and depend on the power of God. My friends, I don't know uh, what in life uh, has tried uh, to deal or has dealt you a knockout blow. I know the count uh, may be up to eight and you are still uh, staggering. And some of you are just wanting uh, the fight to be over so that you can just throw in the towel. Uh, but Paul uh, reminds us that when we are startled and when we are staggering, we need to understand that the victory is not ours, but the victory belongs to God. That's why Paul encourages us by saying, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing this, that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. That's why Paul could say, thanks be unto God who gives you and I the victory. So as Paul uh, begins to look uh, at his weakness and uh, contrast his weakness with the power of God, Paul uh, uses some, some analogies and some comparisons uh, that we're very used to. But as we look at them and as we delve into what Paul is talking about, uh, Paul says that we are afflicted, but not crushed. Remember I said, the psalmist said, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us out of them all. Paul says we are afflicted, but we are not crushed. What Paul is saying here is that we are hard pressed, but not strained. He is saying we are pressed like grapes, but not completely cornered. In other words, when you think about boxing, you know, whenever you start to lose and then start retreating, uh, the worst thing you can do is to let yourself be found in the corner. And if you get stuck in the corner, uh, you don't have a whole lot of ways out uh, and you make yourself an easy target. Uh, but Paul says, yes, we are afflicted, but we not cornered. God does not let us get into a place where we are without any movement. As a matter of fact, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, there is no trial, there is no temptation that will come in your life that is not common to anybody else. And in fact, Paul says, it will not overtake you. It will not overpower you. You will never be in a place where you are without movement because God will always provide an avenue and a way of escape. So Paul says we are afflicted, but not crushed. But then Paul says we are also perplexed and not in despair. What Paul means there is that we are bewildered, but we're not at wit's end. We might be confused, and we might not have a solution, but God has, my friends, an answer. Uh, we may be at a loss, but we're not at complete loss. Paul says, listen, we are persecuted, but not abandoned. In other words, that means, that word abandoned means left behind. But it means that God has not totally left us behind. Paul says we are struck down, but not destroyed. When Paul says we are struck down, but not destroyed, it means we are knocked to the ground, but we are not grounded. Uh, any of us who have been on an airplane, know that one of the most frustrating experiences is for you to be all strapped up, ready to go. Uh, they've gone through all of the instructions and uh, the plane uh, begins to back up and you think you're ready for departure. But then they come on the speaker and say that our instrument panel has indicated that something is wrong with the plane and we've got to pull back in and try to ascertain what is wrong with the plan? As a matter of fact, I think I just stirred up some bad memories from Reverend Caligon. Uh, listen, uh, but whenever uh, you got to pull back in, you might be grounded, but you are not going to be permanently grounded. And listen, life may knock some blows in your life, and you may feel 
like you are struck down, but my friends, you are certainly not grounded. Listen, there are a number of things that Paul would want to instruct us that would help us to know how it is that when we are knocked down, we are not completely knocked out. First thing that Paul would want you and I to take from this text is that we are never knocked out because we have ultimate power. We are never knocked out because we have ultimate power. As a child, many of us can remember one of the things that we feared the most was not just going to the doctor, but knowing that the doctor was going to give us a shot. We didn't want no shot. We didn't want the needle. But when I was little, I don't think they do it now, the doctor, whenever the doctor was going to give you a shot, would give you a lollipop. The intent was that you would suck and lick on the lollipop as a distraction before the doctor rammed that needle in your arm. But as a child, it was very confusing because the person that was supposed to help you was hurting you. The person that was supposed to relieve your pain and make you better, it appeared that they were making it worse. But you've got to understand that God has some power. And whenever we are going through a trial or a tribulation in our life, God has some power that can help us get through whatever it is that you and I are going through. Listen, when we are, we are never knocked out because we have ultimate power. But then secondly, we are never knocked out because we have unlimited power supply. Listen, there was a woman, uh, she died in 1916. Her name was Hattie Green. When Hattie Green died, she died a poor woman. So poor, in fact, that she could not get any medical attention, she thought, for what was ailing her. So poor that she ate cold oatmeal over and over again because she thought she did not have the resources to warm up her oatmeal. But when Hattie Green died, it was discovered that the property that she was living on was appraised in excess of $5 million. She had never had the property appraised. She did not know that she was sitting on wealth, did not know she was a wealthy woman, but died in her mind a poor woman. So many of us don't realize that God has ultimate supply for us. We have spiritual riches in Christ. Uh, and often we are operating as if we are defeated, operating as if our supply will run out. But God is the source and the strength of our life. When life depletes you and you've gone as far as you can go, God has a supply that will never run out. But listen, not only are we never knocked out because we have ultimate power, not only are we never knocked out because we have unlimited supply, but we're never knocked out because we have unending forgiveness. Many of us are knocked down and knocked out, not because of what someone else has done to us. We are knocked down and knocked out because of what we've done to ourselves. But I want you to know God has unending forgiveness. In fact, I call upon the Apostle Paul, Peter, because Peter made more mistakes than anybody else. Uh, but Peter reminds us and shows us in John chapter 20 uh, in verse 21. Uh, because God has unending forgiveness, there is future for failures. And so when we failed and knocked our own self out, it doesn't matter how bad we have failed. Uh, there is future for failures. As a matter of fact, uh, I've got to remind you that the same Peter that was given unlimited forgiveness from God is that same Peter who when Jesus came to him and said, Peter, how many times should you forgive your brother or your sister? Uh, Peter said, 
I don't think I ought to forgive them more than one or two times. Because if they keep on doing the same thing, I think forgiveness ought to run out. It's very ironic that that same Peter is the one that benefited from God's unending forgiveness. And so if, if you were down and staggered, not because of what the world did or not because of what somebody else did, but because of what you did to yourself, God has unending forgiveness. But then last but not least, we are never knocked out because we have unsevering love. We have unsevering love. That same Paul reminds us uh, in the latter part uh, of Romans chapter 8. Uh, Paul says uh, there are going to be some principles. Uh, there are going to be some principalities and uh, some powers and uh, some darkness and uh, some rulers and uh, some difficulties that are going to try to separate you uh, from the love that God has for you. But Paul says we are the beneficiaries of God's unsevering love. In other words, God has a love that can reach to wherever we are. God has a love uh, that can pick us up no matter how far down we may be. Uh, God has a love uh, that can reach down into the valleys and the lowlands of life. So Paul, my friends, is ultimately telling you and I that when we find ourselves afflicted and crushed and down in despair, we've got to have God's perspective of our trials. Uh, so many of us have given up on life because we're trying to make it on our limited perspective and our limited viewpoint. But the psalmist says we've got to have a higher viewpoint. We've got to lift our eyes to the hills from which cometh our help because our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Uh, when Jesus was afflicted and crushed on Calvary's hill. He lifted his head high to the Father. When Jesus felt abandoned on Calvary's cross, he knew he was not abandoned because he had a little talk with his daddy. And his daddy told him, my love is greater than what you're going through. His daddy told him, You've been faithful all the way to the cross. And when you go into the grave, I'm going to pick you up by my power. And that's good news for you and I. Because when we are down in the pits of our life, that same power of God, it'll pick you up. It'll lift you up. It'll raise your head. Because God has a vantage point that is beyond our perspective and beyond our view. Listen, my friends, you may be knocked down, but you are never knocked out. God in heaven, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your unsevering love. Thank you for your unlimited supply. Thank you, God, for your unending forgiveness and thank you, God, for your unlimited power. May now your word bless, instruct, and encourage. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The doors of the church is now open. You may come on a Christian experience, or you may come as a candidate of baptism. From what we've heard today, regardless of what you're going through, you may be grounded, but not knocked out. Not knocked out because we have unlimited power. You're not knocked out because we have unlimited forgiveness. You're not knocked out because we have an unsavoring love. But there are some people here this morning 
may be watching or may be in our presence that woke up this morning very much alive but very much spiritually dead. And I'm here to tell you that even though from a spiritual standpoint you're knocked out, but because of the work done on a cross in an empty grave, you don't have to stay knocked out. Is there anybody here today? Do we have one? I love you forever with all my heart. I love you forever. For my King, I love you forever, forever, with all of my heart, with all my heart, I love you, I love you forever. Forever, forever, you're my king. This time we say, it. my shelter. My shelter. Forever. In times of storm. In times of storm. My shelter forever, forever, Lord, your mercies, your mercies forever.
for your honor and for your praise. We thank you, God, for the wonder, mystery of worship. And God, we pray that as we prepare to depart from this physical location, that God, we would know that you go with us everywhere, over every mountain, through every valley. You never leave, never forsake. And now may the grace of our God and the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit may it rest, rule, and abide with each of us now, henceforth, and forever. Let us all sing together. Hey! 